is also and and uh, yeah, let's go to the uh, next slide. That's just an intro slide. If you can go to presentation, yeah. Thank you. So very similar definitions as uh, Dr. Etis just explained uh, that USDA uses that we probably plagiarized a lot from USDA. Uh, note that uh, of course we don't uh, include uh, antibiotics or antivirals as part of uh, our definitions. Uh, we don't include vectors. We do sometimes uh, are asked to comment about vectors as far as it relates to Texas Animal Health Commission and, and livestock health. If we if we comment, we usually say we have no objection or we do have objection. We don't actually give any kind of permission or approval on vectors, but we will uh, be part of the uh, subject matter expert uh, dialogue on vectors coming into the state, especially as livestock health uh, is concerned. And the bulk of what we do is going to be related to diagnostics and vaccines. Um, so um, let's uh, move to the next slide, please. So we do allow an importation. The primary importation we're involved with is interstate. Um, most of the biologics uh, used in Texas are, are from other states. Uh, inter so interstate use primarily. And so uh, normally, we are the uh, second on this in, in the fact that uh, we do ask that uh, most of them be licensed, uh, at least uh, fully licensed or conditional licensed by USDA uh, Center for Veterinary Biologics. Um, but we can uh, also be involved in uh, giving permission for experimental vaccines. Even most experimental biologics are, have uh, already a database occurring at Center for Veterinary Biologics by USDA. So we're usually in uh, concert with uh, with USDA, even on the experimental vaccines. Uh, the international importation, uh, we do uh, primarily follow that people would have an import permit, and and that also is coordinated more by USDA first, and then uh, us uh, down, downstream. Next slide. Uh, we exclude taking care of the rabies vaccines. That's uh, handled by the Department of State Health Services uh, under their uh, their codes by the Texas Board of Health. So the rabies vaccines, which of course are very important for for pretty much all mammalian species, uh, is handled by by them. We'll we we refer questions or or, or guidance to, to the public health department basically on those rabies vaccines. Next. We do have some restricted biologics of, of, of high importance uh, uh, that's listed there. Um, and and I didn't throw in uh, on, a, on a subsequent slide all of the caveats and, and terms and conditions for using those restricted. But basically, we allow the restricted, restricted biologics uh, to come into the state if uh, if they're killed, especially if they're killed products. If there's been an assessment, there's no uh, risk to human health or animal health. If uh, if there be research studies, and and so we do allow some of these restricted biologics in, but uh, we we are much more deliberate on on these uh, on this page. Next slide. So this is how to contact us. Um, these are just some general inquiries. You can go to comments at thc.texas.gov. Uh, I handle the inquiries that go to biologics uh, at Texas uh, Animal Health Commission. And uh, on the live animals, we're not going to highlight slides on live animals, but uh, appreciate that uh, that our partners at CBP and and USDA APHIS and Texas Department of Agriculture works with our inspectors at ports on live animals. We have a permit department that works on live animals, and that is the bulk of our work, but but it's not handled under our veterinary biologics, the, the live animals, and that's primarily the livestock. We don't get involved on a lot of the uh, exotic animals, on the, especially on the reptiles. We don't get involved on uh, non-human primates. We don't get involved on uh, cat and dogs and other, and, pocket pets, so to speak. But 
certainly on birds that could affect our poultry industry and on uh, any kind of hoof stock uh, that could affect our equine or our cattle industry. Those are, we do have to have a permit on those coming in, both interstate and international. Next slide. Next slide. Just want to give you an example of something uh, fairly unusual. The uh, since 2018, there was about three outbreaks of rabbit hemorrhagic disease of a virus serotype two. This is primarily a disease from uh, Western and Eastern Europe that showed up in I think uh, it might have been Ohio a few years ago, and especially again in Washington State. And we do not have vaccines for this disease. It's a foreign animal disease. And so this is a USDA um, priority, although it's a, it's a challenge because it's not a regulated species uh, by USDA and certainly not by uh, the Texas Animal Health Commission. It's not considered livestock in our codes, but uh, we are certainly, it being an animal, we being an animal health commission, want to assist uh, rabbit owners and, and practicing veterinarians to uh, try to control this disease. And so it did show up uh, as a disease in Texas. And if you, so that was a situation that if you look at the activity, uh, we needed to get documented approval from the APHIS uh, Center for Veterinary Biologics to bring in these imported products uh, that were uh, experimental use. And the result uh, is working with APHIS and working with the uh, import brokers and the state veterinarian who I worked for over 11,000 doses were brought in last year for use uh, by veterinarians. Now, when I say 11,000 doses, there being a million to 2 million rabbits in the state of Texas, this, this is uh, just, just a partial response uh, thus far. Uh, next slide. So as more uh, details on the situation. Uh, as Dr. Ortiz mentioned, the licensing occurs at the CVB for USDA. Uh, there being no license, uh, they did evaluate that there were two killed products that would be uh, safe to use experimentally. There were some other modified live products that they said would not be appropriate to use in the U.S. And so their guidance uh, from their frequently asked questions was, uh, you see the third bullet, was as long as the state animal health official approved the vaccine coming in, they would then in turn allow a special permit uh, application and, and issue the permit. Next slide. So that was a that was a situation where the where the guidance was if the state says yes, then the uh, federal officials will say yes. That was a little unusual. So. We did recommend that most of the practitioners who were going to purchase uh, either from France or Spain the, the products that they would likely want to work with an import broker or customs broker uh, because of the cold chain needed, uh, procuring things with international currency, uh, getting things through, uh, through customs offices and, and making sure the, the product was not inactivated or, or, or come to temperature that was inappropriate. And so that was what a lot most of the folks did. And then uh, we would give approval letters uh, followed by the import permit. Next, please. This is the example of a template that we kind of worked from. We put a lot of terms and conditions on this just as a as a safekeeping, because this being a foreign animal disease, uh, we hope it can get stamped out. We're not sure. It is a Khaleesi virus, so it is a very uh, environmentally persistent virus. It is also in, in the wildlife uh, rabbits. Um, but as far as using it in domestic rabbits, we wanted to have some conditions that licensed veterinarians would keep good records notify their clientele of this being an emergency use vaccine experimental as far as the U.S. is concerned and um, keeping records and making sure there's a good identification on rabbits just in case there's ever an issue uh, with the uh, with the World Health, Health Organization uh, portion of the um, animal health um, 
So next slide, please. And then following that approval, a letter from the state veterinarian, um, then USDA allowed that to be attached as a attachment to the import permit request, and then they would receive this import permit. And Dr. Ortiz mentioned these are good for one year for importing the product, and it had it had a subset of the same terms and conditions that we'd used before. And we worked with USDA, CVB, on um, and others in USDA APHIS to uh, come up with the terms and conditions that this vaccine could be used. Next, please. So this is that was a very unique experience. Uh, Normally, most of our interstate imports uh, are, are licensed vaccine. This is an example of a conditional license vaccine where uh, they are already working with USDA to be compliant with the Title IX Code of Federal Reg Regulations, Part 102.6, as far as conditional license. These are basically vaccines that are, are, are in the process of a full license and in USDA allows them to be used uh, to continue to gather evidence of efficacy and, and safety. So again, this is where USDA has already approved this as a conditional vaccine. And according to our uh, Animal Health Commission codes, uh, they still need a permission from the state veterinarian to be used in Texas. Next, please. And we do have five oh. more minutes in the presentation. Okay, thank you. So again, this is our contact information, just to highlight, uh, if you have any inquiries, whether uh, uh, you know people who are frustrated or, or want to use a product in Texas and they don't know how to, direct them to our website. This is how they would contact us. Similarly, uh, through our website is how they can get a hold of how to get an import permit for live animals. And uh, so, that was uh, next slide. I think that this is just my contact information at the end. If anyone's got any further questions, and of course, if there's any chat or any questions, now um, we can handle that. That's I'm ready for questions. Adam, had you received any questions? And Mary, this is Sean. I think Adam had to step out. I'm not seeing anything in the chat at this point. Great, great presentation. Thank you. Um, our next speaker.